Hi, welcome to Beyond Politics. I'm Catherine Clark. Supreme Court Justice Marshall Rothstein grew up in 1940s Winnipeg, the only son of hard-working immigrants from Eastern Europe who insisted that their son receive a university education. He went on to a long and successful legal career before being appointed to the federal court and in 2006 becoming Prime Minister Stephen Harper's first appointment to the Supreme Court of Canada. Mr. Justice Marshall Rothstein joins me now to talk about life on the Supreme Court. Mr. Justice Marshall Rothstein, welcome to Beyond Politics. It is a true pleasure to have you here. Thank you. My pleasure. You, uh, as far as I understand it, worked on a dining car, a railway car, to uh, pay your way through university. Is that true? Yeah, you must have done your homework. Yeah, I did. What was that experience like? What did it teach you about people and about yourself? I must say that I... Um, uh, I had no idea what I was getting into when I when I got the job, but uh, uh, but uh, you're living when you're working on a dining car, uh, you're uh, on a train for 36 or 48 hours. Uh, you're working in close quarters with nine or ten other people, and these people all come from different backgrounds. Uh, they have different prejudices. They have different views on things. Uh, there are different ages, different educational backgrounds. You have to learn how to get along in that environment, very close quarters. And, um, and uh, there's a hierarchy in the dining car. The, uh, the dining car steward was like the king. And the, uh, the uh, first waiter was like the Prince of Wales. And, um, and uh, it kind of went all the way down to, to me. And what were you? You were the lowest. I was the rung lowest. The... I started out as what they call the pantry man, uh, looking after the salads and the water glasses and the ice and things like that. And then I became a waiter, but I was still the lowest waiter. And um, and then eventually, over the years, as I worked uh, there, I I kind of became a little more senior. But uh, uh, but uh, r rarely was I ever at the highest levels. Did you have to live in a car with all of these people with whom you worked during the day? Yeah, uh, it kind of depended upon what train you were working on, but on some trains, the, uh, there, there was a crew quarters where you slept. On other trains, you actually took down the tables in the dining car and you put up cots and you slept on those cots and then you took them down in the morning and set up the tables and got started again. So it depended upon which the configuration of the particular train was. How were you treated by the people who were um, being seated and eating in the dining car? The customers? Yes. Well, uh, people were very nice as far as I can recall. I mean, the whole idea was to earn tips. And uh, so you were trying to be as nice as you could to people in the hope, in the hope that they would uh, be generous with you. and. Uh, and uh, generally, the people were very good, and um, and uh, they, they they were polite. I I don't recall ever having a, a, a difficult situation with with the customer. Uh, they, it, it was all very pleasant. What was a good tip in those days? Well, <laughs> trying to think back, um, uh, when I started, I remembered earning ninety one cents an hour. That was my that was my wage. And uh, for, a, for a trip from Winnipeg to Vancouver, uh, that amounted to maybe 40 bucks or $45 or something like that. And uh, so the tips, uh, perhaps 50 cents, or occasionally I think maybe somebody left a dollar bill. In those days they still had dollar bills. And um, Occasionally, somebody might leave a dollar bill, but uh, that was that was pretty extraordinary when that occurred. How did you end up working on a dining car? I mean, there are so many other potential jobs that you could have done, I assume. How did you end up doing that particular job? I think I started in 1959, and there was a kind of a recession, and there were no jobs for 
for students. I was a student. And uh, uh, the only job that I could get was delivering freight bills for the CPR on a bicycle. And it was May, and the weather was terrible, and it was raining all the time, and I was riding my uh, bicycle. I don't even think it was a three-speed. And uh, I was riding my bicycle all over Winnipeg, uh, delivering these freight bills. And after about a week, I just knew that that wasn't for me. And I went in, and uh, the, the boss looked at me, and he said, you don't like the job, eh? And uh, I said, well, I'm having a little trouble. And he said, look, uh, you go over to the dining car office. They may need somebody there. And he sent me over there, and I went there, and lo and behold, they did need somebody, and well, that's what happened. Tell me about um, the impact that that had on your view of people moving forward, because I had read, I think, a, a quote that you actually screened the people who work for you, your, your law clerks or others, to see if they've done um, jobs of that nature, because you feel that that was such an important experience for you. Why do you do that? You know, as lawyers and as judges, we, we tend to live in a pretty in, enclosed world. Uh, there, most people in the world are out there slogging out very, very difficult physical work, sometimes dangerous work. Uh, I think that the experience that I had working in the dining car made me realize that uh, there was a different life out there and that uh, as a lawyer I was going to be very lucky that I wasn't going to have to work outside in inclement weather, perhaps in dangerous situations or for that ma matter in a dining car. In those days uh, we weren't allowed to sit down. If there was one customer in the dining car we had to stand up so we were standing up all day long. Uh, with very short breaks. Uh, and I want to make sure that uh, my law clerks and the people that I am working with have some idea of what that life is about because they're going to be dealing with, with people uh, in, in, in those difficult jobs. And as judges, they're going to have, as, as lawyers and as judges, they're going to have to be making decisions for people in those situations. And they've got to have some relationship with them. So I want to make sure that when I have a law, when I hire a law clerk, that the law clerk has had some experience with, uh, with, with working in something other than a theoretical educational world where they know what it's like uh, to be in the school of hard knocks, if you like. That's a remarkably empathetic and compassionate way of, of looking at the work that you do, both um, that lawyers do, but that you as a judge do. Um, is that just how you are, where you're raised to, uh, to see that other people uh, live in difficult situations? Um, I, I, th I don't know that I was, really. Um, but it was perhaps that experience that I had that made me realize uh, what was really going on in the world. So I, I think it was that that, uh, that maybe motivated my, my uh, experience uh, and, and the way in which I viewed uh, the world and, and people working in the world. Your parents had immigrated to Canada from Eastern Europe, and they came separately, yes. as I understand. And they met here. Yes. Is that right? Yes. Yeah. What, um, <clears throat> what were they like as people? What were they like as parents? My uh, father uh, came from Poland in 1912. My mother from Bielorussia, what they called Bielorussia in those days, in 1908. So they were part of that great wave of immigration that populated the prairies uh, before the First World War. My mother came to Winnipeg with her family. My father went to Yorkton, Saskatchewan, where I believe he had an older brother, or, or perhaps two brothers, who had, uh, who had moved there from Poland. Um, uh, he became a, a bookkeeper and uh, then later became 
a merchant, small merchant. Um, and uh, so that was kind of his, his life. My mother uh, had become a, a school teacher, and she had been a teacher. And then I think when they got married, she stopped working. That was the, the custom in those days. And, um, and so that was their, uh, their, their working life. Um, uh, as parents, they were, I was an only child. Uh, they, were, uh, they were very uh, concerned. Uh, the one thing that they hammered into my head that I recalled was that I had to get an education. Neither of them had received university educations. Uh, there was never any question in my world that I had to go out and get a university education. And I remember perhaps that's the greatest influence that, that they may have had on me. Did they allow you to choose your own profession or did they have specific interests for what they felt you should become? Well, my father uh, was, uh, he was kind of a numbers guy, and uh, uh, he, I think he, I, I know that he wanted me to become an actuary. He thought that being an actuary was the greatest kind of job that there could be, but he had to settle for a lawyer. <laughs> was he okay with that in the end? In the end, yeah. Did he have a problem with it? No, 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 no. I, I, I don't think so. I, um, I, I think, frankly, that they, they just wanted to make sure that I got an education, that I got a job. Right, right, so that you weren't living at home for the rest of your life. Well, I, I suppose. <laughs> <laughs> now, why the law? What was it about the law that attracted you? Because sometimes, you know, when your parent tells you, this is what I'd like you to do, and I think you'd be great at this, that has an influence on a young person. Why Why did you choose something different, and why was it the law? In my family, I, there were no lawyers, and uh, so I, I didn't have any lawyer role models or anything like that uh, that influenced me. Um, but I was kind of interested in public speaking and in persuasion, and uh, perhaps those were the seeds uh, uh, that were planted. And then I took my Bachelor of Commerce, all with the view of becoming an actuary. And I, I wasn't bad in math. I was pretty good in math in, in high school and in uh, early university. But when I got into a lot of the theoretical stuff, um, uh, I just knew that being an actuary wasn't for me. And uh, so I continued in commerce until I, uh, until I graduated. In the year that I, and then, actually, I uh, w was, was out looking for jobs. But in that final year of commerce, I ran for the presidency of the University of Manitoba Students' Union. And lo and behold, I won. So I had to stay in school, at least for another year. And I thought about taking my honors year in commerce. And... Uh, I remember having an interview with the dean and figuring I wasn't going to learn much more than I already learned uh, uh, from from under from from the first degree, and uh, probably spoke to some other people, and uh, the only the, the other influence and perhaps one of the the, the the key influences was that in my final year of commerce uh, we were taught uh, commercial law various uh, courses, very summary courses in contracts and insurance and bills of exchange and things like that by a teacher who came, out, who came to teach us in commerce from the uh, law school. Uh, his name was Cliff Edwards. And, uh, and he taught those courses in a way that uh, made contracts and bills of exchange and things like that very real to me and showed me how they were dealing, they, they were subjects that people are dealing with every day. Every day we're in, getting involved in making contracts with other people and, uh, uh, and, and we were dealing with money and uh, exchanging goods for money and so forth and bills of exchange and things like that. And, uh, and uh, he was so clear and made the law so real to me that I think that was kind of the real 
important influence, if you like, immediate influence, that suggested to me that in view of the fact that I had to stay in school, uh, well, I may as well go into law. Were you good at it? Were you good at law school? I was okay. I, I didn't win the gold medal, but I was, I, if I say so, I was near the near the, the upper end of the class, the top of the class. And what did you end up practicing? What specific area of law did you end up practicing once you had got articled and gone into practice? Uh, I, I was articled to a lawyer whose name is well known in Manitoba and Winnipeg and elsewhere, Arthur Morrill. Uh, Art had a practice in some things, but primarily or essentially in transportation law. And uh, so being articled to him, I started to get exposed to transportation law and, uh, well, decided that I kind of liked it. Uh, transportation law in those days, transportation was pretty highly regulated and the, uh, the issues involved uh, economic issues, financial and economic issues. And so that had kind of a connection to what I had learned when I had taken my Bachelor of Commerce. And this all fit together and it was uh, quite uh, uh, interesting to me. And uh, so I ended up uh, trying, to, trying to develop a practice in transportation law. Uh, art left the practice of law after I was out of law school uh, two and a half years and um, and I, I thought that was the end of it. I would never uh, uh, be able to develop a transportation law practice but with a partner of mine, Jim Foran, uh, we both together tried to uh, develop the practice and lo and behold uh, we were able to. What was it like for you to go from the practice of something that you found very interesting to becoming a judge? Was it as enjoyable? Well, I... Uh, I or had uh, you had enough of the practice of law by the <laughs> yeah. time you became a judge? No, but what I, what I realized when I became a judge uh, in 1992 in the federal court was that in transportation law, and, and I was doing competition law at that time too, but. I, I used to say that I was finding that I was learning more and more about less and less. And uh, when I became a judge, I started to see that there are a whole variety of areas of law that I had never even thought about or heard about. And uh, so the, 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 that was quite a, quite a change for me and a, quite a learning curve for me. And uh, so that was, the, that was kind of the major change that occurred. Uh Moving on to your current position as a Justice of the Supreme Court of Canada, I, what, how did you know that you were being considered for the position? Is, I mean, do they just pick one person and call that person and say, are you interested? Or did you, um, did you know that you were being considered but others were being considered too? As you may know, uh, in the Supreme Court there's been a tradition that uh, one judge is appointed from the Maritimes, uh, one from the Prairies, one from British Columbia, three from Ontario, and by law, three from uh, Quebec. So when uh, Justice Major, my predecessor, uh, uh, w w was in the process of, of leading to his retirement, he was in his last year, there was all kinds of speculation about who would uh, be appointed to replace him. And so I began to hear that my, my name was somehow in play. And, uh, well, once you hear that, more and more people come to you and they just say, uh, you know, is it true? And would you be interested? And uh, would you do it? And so forth. And, I, uh, uh, and so that's how I, I kind of got to know that uh, my, my name was out there and was being considered. But honestly, I didn't think that they would they would choose me. But why? You know, my name was there. Why didn't you think they'd choose you? Oh, a variety of reasons. Um, uh, I just um, first of all, I I I came from Manitoba, and Saskatchewan had not had a, uh, a Supreme Court judge, I think, since Emmett Hall. So they, uh, it was their turn, if you like. 
And so I guess I thought that, uh, that they would appoint somebody from Saskatchewan. And, oh, there were some other reasons, but, um, but I'm, I, I really didn't take it too seriously, at least not to begin with. Did they call you and ask you if you would take it more seriously? Did you have to agree to um, being vetted or however it, however it transpires? Because I, I would have been so nervous. You hear your name floated around, and it's something I'm sure that you would find quite enjoyable, but you have to wait and wait and wait. Well, you know, as, as people were talking to me about it, you know, they said, well, you're going to have to accept it, or might you not accept it? And uh, I remember saying to myself, well, if I'm asked, I, I think I'd probably accept it, but I'm happy in the Federal Court of Appeal, and so if I, if I got it, I would be fine. If I didn't get it, I would be fine. And so it wasn't really, I, I wasn't um, uh, looking at it as if it was uh, the, the holy grail, if you like. I don't mean to downplay it, but, uh, uh, but I, I didn't view it as, as, as the, the burning desire that, that perhaps some people thought, I, th thought some candidates would have. Where were you when you received the phone call asking if you would become the next... Well, Justice. I was in Toronto, <laughs> and I was um, uh, I was in Toronto. I had just finished hearing some cases, and I uh, stayed over because I was I had been asked to speak at Osgoode Hall, the uh, law school, the following day, and I got a call from my secretary at uh, I think it was maybe around four o'clock in the afternoon. And uh, she called me, and she was hardly able to get her words out. And she said, uh, the prime minister's office called. <laughs> and so I said, well, OK. And, um, and so she put me through to the prime minister's office. And the, the person at the prime minister's office said, if, if the prime minister called you in an hour, would you be available? And I said, yes. And uh, this had been. This was February the tenth, nineteen uh, February the tenth, two thousand and six. Uh, Prime Minister Harper and his government had been elected on January twenty third, and we knew, I knew, that part of his uh, party platform had been that uh, Supreme Court judges uh, candidates should be uh, uh, vetted by a parliamentary committee. So I knew what what his policy was, but uh, in that one hour between uh, 4 o'clock and 5 o'clock waiting for his call, um, I remember praying that he wouldn't ask me to go through that. <laughs> and anyway, I got the call at 5, and he said, uh, okay, he said, um, uh, be prepared to accept the job, and I said, uh, Yes, and he said there are two conditions. He said the first condition is that you can't say anything until the government announces, and the second condition is that there's going to be a parliamentary hearing. <laughs> and and um, I um, did you say no? Then I don't want it. <laughs> no, I didn't do that. <laughs> but um, but uh, I I I said to him, well, how, you know, what am I to expect? And. He explained to me that uh, the parliamentary committee would be a, a process, but not like the advise and consent process in the United States. They would not have the power to veto me, and um, and uh, that's so, at least somewhat reassuring. Well, it was, except that I I I then said to him, "Well, what if what if I don't do well before the parliamentary committee?" And his response was, "Just don't screw up." <laughs> <laughs> and so that was uh, that was the call, and then of course. So with those wonderful words of reassuring wisdom, <laughs> yes, that's right. you are thrown to the wolves at this parliamentary <laughs> committee. You must have been quite concerned. Well, um, it, it was uh, concerning, but um, you made you it know, through. Well, you have, you but know, it was you, terrifying. You have to go. You, 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 life is full of challenging experiences, and you. 
you have to go through things. And so if you're offered uh, an opportunity and it's going to require uh, you to go through something, uh, whether you like it or not, if you, if you think or hope you can do it, well, you do it. Has it all been worth it? I mean, having had to go through that trial by fire, was it? Uh, oh, well, yes. You enjoy the work here. Well, it's, it's, look, I've been exceedingly lucky in my whole life, but, you know, uh, your opportunity, the opportunity of uh, getting a job here as a judge is very, very, very restricted. You have to be at the right place at the right time, and, uh, you know, there are many people out there who are highly qualified, well qualified to be here. Uh, I just happen to be in the right place at the right time, and I... Uh, uh, it has been a marvelous experience, an incredible experience, uh, being here and being able to to have the the advantage that uh, that we have of dealing with the issues that we deal with. Um, the um, I have a quote from the Chief Justice. She said, "Perhaps our biggest challenge will be trying to ensure that Marshall leaves the office somewhat before midnight." You're a tireless <laughs> worker, apparently. She said they might have to lock the doors on the weekends. I, uh, I've said before that uh, when I took this job, uh, they gave me a little raise, but my hourly rate went down. <laughs> <laughs> and and um, uh, the, the amount of work is, is, is enormous. And, uh, you know, I have colleagues, very, very brilliant, frankly, colleagues, who are capable of reading and absorbing and understanding what they read on the first pass through and retaining it. And uh, I'm envious because for me, it takes me a long time to read. I have to reread and I have to think. And, uh, and it just takes me a long time to, 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 to cover the material. So some people have to spend a little more time, some people a little less, but, um, but that's, the, that's the nature of the work for me. You have had um, such a remarkable career in the law. When the time comes for you to leave the law and to leave the Supreme Court, what do you think you're going to do? Well, it's interesting that you should ask me that question um, about six or eight months ago, I got an email from my wife. And she said, she asked the same question. She said, uh, you're going to get the hook from the Supreme Court in a couple of years. Uh, what do you, have you thought about what you're going to do? And uh, I sent her back an email, and I said, well, I haven't given it much thought. And she said, well, you're going to have to leave. You better put out some feelers and find a job. So... Um, How long have you been married? Well, this year it'll be 47 years, I think. It sounds like it. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> anyway, um, um, I, I haven't put out any feelers, and frankly, I can't put out feelers while I'm working here. But, um, but uh, well, I'm hoping that I'll be healthy enough mentally and physically to be able to carry on with, uh, with doing things. More, many judges uh, who leave here... Uh, and, and who leave uh, other courts, uh, go on to do uh, work in different fields, arbitrations and advising and that kind of thing. It sounds as though you are not going to retire in golf. I, I can't play golf. <laughs> my wife and I are not golfers. Uh, I think my wife took golf lessons and uh, the pro fired her. And um, I go out so rarely that it's an embarrassment. So, I, so you're going I to stick try. to the law. Well, I don't, do, I don't play golf, so what else is there? <laughs> Mr. Justice Rothstein, it's been such a pleasure. Thank you very much for agreeing to the interview. Thank you.